Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, opposition groups in Burundi remain skeptical about President Kurunziza's agreement to hold talks to end almost a year of crisis. The UN's chief announced the Burundians' apparent willingness to start political dialogue whilst on a trip to the country. Also, Fiduma Daib is the Kenyan-born Somali presidential hopeful who knows that she's facing an uphill battle, but she says that she's no stranger to a challenge and hopes to defy conservative norms. Also, Waxworks. We meet the man who set up shop in Paris's African expat neighborhood. Yusuf Fafana has started selling contemporary styles made of traditional printed wax fabrics. After a meeting with Burundi's leader on Tuesday, the UN's chief said that the government agreed to hold serious talks aimed at ending 10 months of violent unrest. However, it wasn't long before some opposition politicians expressed their scepticism about the sincerity of President Pierre Kurenziza's plan. It was a visit tinged with hope of bringing calm to a troubled country. Ban Ki-moon met Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza in Bujumbura. The president asked the UN Secretary General for his help in kick-starting national reconciliation talks and showed his own willingness to heal wounds. We've asked for the UN's assistance when it comes to initiating talks to reconcile Burundians. Everyone knows that Burundians always come together when it comes to talks. We've shown our commitment with the announcement to free 2,000 prisoners, excluding those accused of disturbing the peace. 400 people have died in clashes and a quarter of a million have fled the country since Nkurunziza attempted and succeeded in running for a third term in April last year. He blames Rwanda for involvement in the protests, but he also offered an olive branch. We also discussed the problems of the region, particularly what we see as Rwandan aggression. We have evidence to prove this. We also asked Mr. Ben to help Burundi and Rwanda live in peace, the way things were before. Ban Ki-moon had previously met leaders of political parties after arriving Monday night. He said the president had also assured him media restrictions would be lifted during the visit. I was very much encouraged that the political leaders, whether they are sitting in government, ruling party or opposition, they promised that they will engage in inclusive dialogue. This is what President M. Kuziza also confirmed, that he will be engaging in inclusive dialogue. President Nkurunziza will meet with other African leaders, including South African President Jacob Zuma, later this week to address the political situation. Burundi has already rejected plans to send in African Union peacekeepers, saying it would regard it as an invasion. After Burundi, Ban Ki-moon headed over the border to DR Congo to visit a camp for displaced people there. The east of the country has been plagued by armed conflict between rival militia for decades. Thomas Nicolin tells us more. Ban Ki-moon only stayed for a few hours in eastern Congo. He landed at around 12 noon at Goma Airport and then right away went to the village of Kitshanga where he met various uh, women, women who explained to Ban Ki-moon how difficult it is for them to live in these camps. Uh, he then met uh, various children and he said to these children that uh, he himself had been a displaced person and that, and that maybe one day one of them could be uh, Secretary General of the UN. Uh, Ban Ki-moon will be arriving in Kinshasa tonight. Tomorrow, tomorrow he will be participating uh, in a conference about investment in uh, the Great Lakes region and how to promote peace and development. And right after that, he will be meeting with uh, Joseph Kabila, and he might talk to him about the complicated electoral process in, in DR Congo and the fact that the international community fears uh, Joseph Kabila might run for a third-term bid, which is prohibited by the Constitution. Thomas Nicolas there for us in Kinshasa. Well, in Niger, opposition parties alleging widespread fraud have warned that they will not recognize results from Sunday's parliamentary and legislative elections. Now, they accuse the government of voter intimidation and say that a victory by President Mohamedou Issoufou would be invalid. Partial results already indicate that he has a lead. Provisional results are expected by Friday. 
South African universities temporarily closed after black protesters who disrupted a rugby match clashed with white fans. The demonstrators were demanding an end to the outsourcing of cleaning jobs at the University of Free State when they invaded the field in the middle of a varsity game between UFS and Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Now, they were then attacked by some spectators. Protests continued on Tuesday as students destroyed the statue of apartheid-era politician Charles Robert Swart. South African campuses have seen a wave of race-related protests over the last year. Now, Fadumo Daib is the first woman to set her sights on the Somalian presidency. She's determined to stand up to a system that's long sidelined women. After being forced to flee Kenya, her Somali-born family moved to Finland as refugees. There, she got an education, only learning to read at 14. She later went on to work for the UN in Liberia and study in the US. All the while, she was set on eventually encouraging positive change in Somalia. Now, she was in Paris for a conference on the role of African women. I earlier asked her about the hurdles she faced and her political aspirations. We won't have free and fair elections in 2016. We will continue having 4.5 clan system based electoral um, system, which means the four clans plus the minority clans sharing power. And this is a system that actually shuts out women and the youth. The challenges that I would face in a system like that is the level of corruption is very, very high because 275 members of parliament are the ones who will choose the next president, and they often choose through payment, and you have to pay quite a lot of money. The other challenge is the challenge of um, it's a male-dominated society. We have, um, for example, Al-Shabaab, we have other groups who feel that a woman's place is either at home or in a grave. And if she cannot stay you know, at home, they will make sure she gets into a, a grave. And then we also have really um, the issue of um, a whole generation that knows nothing else other than war. You know, they don't, they've not had the uh, opportunity to study and, and to, to see um, a stable um, country. If you'll excuse me, it, it does not sound likely that you're going to get very far. So is it for you as important to be seen to participate? My only objective is not really to get into office. It's not to obtain power. My objective is to make sure that we address the inequities that we have in Somalia, the inequality that we have in Somalia. And you do that through instigating social change. What I'm doing is part of that. Getting into office or running to get into office is one of that, because there is a prevalent belief that no woman, or even girls, should not aspire to this kind of um, positions. And so by really coming forward you know, and, and, and doing this, and actually um, being a very credible candidate at that, if we had free and fair elections today, I would like to believe that you know, I would stand a very, very good chance. But unfortunately, we're going through a very corrupt system, which doesn't look at competency, but it only looks at money. Well, and finally, the neighborhood of Chateau Rouge in Paris is right at the center of the city's African expat community. Now there, a new label is using traditional African printed wax fabrics to make modern clothes. And though it's pretty much still a startup, business is booming. France 24 met with the fashion founder, Youssef Fofana. Every morning, Youssouf Fofana tours the Chateau Rouge neighborhood in the north of Paris in search of the finest African wax prints. Diversity of patterns and quality of fabric, for him, every detail is crucial. What's surprising is that it's the traditional fabrics that are the most resistant, and they're the most popular too. Their unique patterns each have their own meaning. And when Yusuf can't decide, Asafu is there to help. She knows the fabrics inside out, down to their sometimes unlikely names. They have two or three different names each, depending on the country, Mali, Ghana, Senegal. I'm mostly familiar with the Ghanaian and Ivorian names. This one is called President Kennedy. Youssef launched his brand, Maison Chateau Rouge, in May 2015, and in under a year, business has flourished. 
Our website launched late in the night. It was around 3 a.m., and the next day we had orders from Japan and the United States. It's truly an international customer base, but there are also a lot of Parisians, people who live in Chateau Rouge and who wear our outfits with pride. All of Youssef's creations are currently sold out, but worry not. Maison Chateau Rouge's new collection is set to come out on February 27th. I'm giving me some ideas there to spice up my own outfit. Well, that is, though, where we're going to have to leave it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us and take care.